Welcome to Holy Scripture Television. My name is Johan Oldenkamp, and in this fourth episode of Holy Scripture TV, we're going to talk about pistis. That's a Greek word meaning faith. So pistis is the subject of this episode, and it's very important that you have seen the previous three episodes, because otherwise you will not fully get what I'm explaining here. So if you've not seen the previous three episodes, then click on pause under this video and then first watch those previous three episodes. Yeah, in the first episode, I explained about the meaning of the story of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob had to change later on his name into Israel, also what that name means. Yeah, it's all science there. And then next, I explained in the second episode about Babylon. People think it is an ancient city. Well, that's true. But the stories that we find in the Holy Scripture are not about that ancient city. They are about present day Babylon. And present day Babylon gets into a major war with present day Magog. And that is explained in the third episode. So if you've not seen these three, then make sure you do that before you continue watching it, watching this fourth episode. And also, like I explained in the previous episodes, this video is not for free. Of course, you can continue watching it for free, but at the end of this video, you have to be very honest to yourself and you have to tell yourself what this video is worth to you. And if it is worthless, then you don't owe me anything. But if it is worth something to you, then that worth you owe me. And my suggestion is that you pay half of that money to me. And you can find how to do that under the donation button on my website. And I think I'm entitled to this value because I give you this value. So I think we should bring it in balance. Okay. That's the contract we make when you continue watching this video. So let's have a start with this fourth one on Pistis. I'll switch off my camera. It's no longer necessary. Pistis is the first part of the title of this book that was written around 350 of our current era. And actually the name is put on this book later on, but it's, I think it's very uh, helpful to understand what this book is about. Yeah, actually it was part of the second chapter, the title of the second chapter, but it doesn't really matter too much. And it was discovered in the year 1773. And we know it was originally written in Greek, but somehow that Greek version is lost. And we only have the Coptic version, and it's known as the SQ Codex. And there are other codices as well, like these two, the Berlin Codex, for instance. And they are all Gnostic writings. So we know this, this is a very important Gnostic book. And the title, Pistis Sophia, means literally faith and wisdom. And both of them, and especially Sophia, are not just concepts, but they were also names of goddesses, goddesses from ancient times. And they are named Sizigi. Uh, in Gnosticism. As Zizigi, if we understand the name, it's related to yokings together or yoked together. So it's about a yoke. And there are two. Yeah, like we have two oxes here. One head is here and the other ox is there in front of a wagon. So they, those oxes are yoked together and the same is true for the Sizigis or the Sisi guy actually, because they were always in couples, a young one and a yin one, or a male and a female, a god and a goddess. And nowadays we still have this term, but now in astrophysics, uh, astronomy, when we talk about a conjunction of stars or planets or heavenly bodies, yeah, when they are in one line, when they are somehow aligned, and that's here too, they are aligned uh, via this yoke. So it's all about Gnosis, but Gnosis doesn't mean simply knowledge, it actually means spiritual knowledge, 
or knowledge about yourself, self-knowledge, knowledge on the inside. That's the true meaning of Gnosis in Gnosticism. And Gnosticism tells us there is but one God, one God in the very middle of the whole of reality. And that's, of course, also what holy science is telling you, because it's the very same. And we can use different names for that oneness in the center of everything, in the heart, in the source of reality. Holy science refers to it as the source world, the world of God, the first world. And Gnosticism calls God the monad, because it actually means the first being. This is the one, the one in the middle, the good one, the good God. Yeah, the absolute, because we, here we find absolute truth. Yeah, this is subjective. Uh, the outer ring is objective truth. The middle ring, the, the middle ring in between, the second one, is subjective truth. But here we find absolute truth of God. And God is the sovereign, the one and only sovereign, the ineffable parents because yeah from here everything is created so we can see God as a parent but we cannot yeah, name God very precisely because we have no idea it's beyond everything we understand so that's why it's ineffable in Gnosticism God is also referred to as the perfect aeon because aeon were actually the gods yeah, related with with, uh, with time because in the level of God, there is no time nor space. Actually, time is in the second ring, and the third and outer ring, there is space. And also, it was known, or God was named depths of profundity, profundity, bitos. So it's going really deep. It's unmeasurably deep, the understanding of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Before the beginning, because the beginning is actually the second ring, that's where it begins. Yeah, that's where we find uh, the dynamics of time, of movement. And God himself, or itself, or yeah, any way you like to call God, God is the beginning. Yeah, and also the ending, by the way, the Alpha and the Omega. And it's also the first principle, because from the first principle, all other principles arose. And here, at the level of God, the first circle, the middle circle, there is silence. Yeah, some refer to it as universal stillness. So there is no movement here. The movement starts in the second circle. This is all explained in depth in holy science. Gnosticism refers to the second circle as the pleroma. And that means the fullness. And then the outer circle, the third circle, is called the kenoma, and that means the emptiness. Because actually the outer ring is empty, there's nothing there. All that is there are created from the pleroma. They are shadows or, or projections. Yeah, I can call them also illusions. The outer ring is the world of illusion. Maya, it's called in India. Yeah, it seems real, but it is not real. It's only created from the middle ring. So that's what um, Gnosticism is, is uh, explaining you. And holy science uses different words, but it's of course the very same. Now, the reality consists of three concentric circles. And our senses can only see the outer circle. And also in the previous episodes, we saw these three circles in, in, in the story of Jacob and Esau, for instance. So what is God? Well, God is immeasurable, yeah. Illim Ill illimitable, so that you cannot put limits on God. Invisible, unutterable, unnameable, undefiled. Yeah, there is no, nothing, nothing yeah, wrong or, or any, any kind of uh, weakness or whatever. Incorruptible. God is goodness, God is purity, God is changeless, because there is no dynamics at the level of God. God is, period. And from God, from the central circle, the source, 
there were gods created, pairs of a god and a goddess. And the first pair that was created is named by um, Gnosticism as the Propator and Enoya, that means the forefather and intention. Yeah, so this is the first male god, and this is the first female goddess. Yeah, and they are below the level of gods. They are in the second ring, the ring of the Pleiro Pleiro Pleroma. And they got children too, because out of these two, the forefather and the intention, we got mind and disclosure. And from mind and disclosure, we got reason and life. And from reason and life, we got the human being and assembly. Yeah, people somehow try to relate this word ecclesia to church, but actually it's about an inner assembly, not an outer assembly of people in a building. That's a misunderstanding. It's an inner assembly within a human being. Yeah, because that's why they are connected here. This is the outside, this is the inside. And in ancient Kemet, this was already known in the ancient kingdom. Because they just named the gods and goddesses differently, but it's the very same. Because it started with Nun and Naumet, yeah, the wateriness pair. Then we got He and Hotet, infinity pair. Then Kuk and Kauket, the darkness pair. And finally Amun and Amonet, the hiddenness pair. So these were the names from ancient, uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. And that's more than 2,500 years older than, um, than what we see here, because Gnosticism is around 150 of our current era. Yeah, or maybe a little bit earlier, but around that, that time, let's say 100 or something. That means that this is 2,600 years older, because everything we know from Gnosticism is based on what we knew in ancient Egypt, in ancient Kemet. And later on, those four pairs were renamed and people added some, some information to that understanding. Then they were renamed to Shu and Tefnu. There was the first couple. Yeah, they came directly from the source. And the source was known as Ra because it refers to the light. Yeah, or some say Atum, Atum Ra. And then Shu and Tefnu got children too. They were named Geb and Nut. And they got children too. And then we see Osiris and Isis and Set and Nep Nephthys. And these are eight again. Eight again. So this is the Octad, uh, the uh, Octad. Those eight together with the one at the top create a nine. And that's why people talked about in those days the Aeneid of Heliopolis, the nine. And based on that, we got the Aeneagram. It all makes a lot of sense if you understand holy science. Holy science says Shu is fire. Yeah, it says wind, but it means solar wind, so radiation, fire. And rain is, of course, water. And earth is earth and sky is, is air. So that makes sense too. Yeah, this is male, female, but here it is reversed, female, male. Yeah, that has to do with the mirroring of this level and that level, but I'm not going to explain that now. Anyway, they got children, logos and life, yeah, reason and life, and that were 10. So now we have the decat. Profound and mixture are a couple. Yeah, undecaying and union is a couple. Self-begotten and delight is a couple. Immovable and blending. Actually, this is the blending of two people, yeah, having uh, um, uh, intercourse, if you want. They become one, two become one. That's the blending meant here. And only begotten and blessed. So these are five couples creating ten, the decat. And then the last, uh, the anthropos and the ecclesia, the human being and the assembly, the inner assembly, they have children of their own too. Also, pairs of God and goddesses, and that's what we see here. The comforter or the helper, comforter, comforter and the helper, they are the God, and faith is their goddess. Paternal with hope, here we see maternal, and yeah, actually these 
six are all young. So sometimes this is perverted, this corrupted. Some, sometimes you see a different name here. But it has to be maternal, even though it is in the young line. Together with love, ecclesiastical, yeah, <coughs> has nothing to do with the church. This is uh, simply the adverb of, um, uh, of assembly. So it is the inner assembly and that it results in understanding. Then we have praise with felicity and finally volition and wisdom. Yeah, will, power, wisdom. Here we see at the top Pistis and at the bottom Sophia, and that's the title of the book we started with. So it's a reference to this level. And we'll continue with Sophia because that's, that's actually what's important here. But when we look at the first three on the right hand side, faith, hope, and love, well, that's what we find also in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Yeah, and some people put this around their neck. An anchor, a cross, and a heart. The heart is for love, the anchor is for hope, and the cross, it is set for faith. Well, is that really true? Yeah, that the anchor is for hope, that is also in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verse 19. The hope set before us, which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and entering to, into that within the veil. I'll come back to the veil later on. So hope is symbolized by the anchor. That makes sense. But what about this? Yeah, this is the cross of Christianity. But what this cross really is, are six squares ordered like this. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. So two at the bottom, one at the right hand side, one on the left hand side, and one at the top, and one in the middle. These are the six sides of a cube. So actually it represents a cube. Yeah, if you bring this one up, and that one too, and that one too, and this one too, and then you later bend on this one over, then you get the six sides of a cube. I hope you can do this in your mind. So actually the cross represents the cube. And the cube represents six. And that's the six of Saturn. So when you have this faith, you and you use this symbol, then you express that you have faith in Saturn. Not in the light, but in darkness. And that's why that cube is always black. Black is the opposite of light. So, we have these 12 children, if you like, from the human being and the assembly, the inner assembly. And the last one, the last goddess, is Sophia. And Sophia should actually make love with volition, yeah, with willpower, in order to create the gods of the uh, Kenoma. But she did not. She did not consort it, if you want, with Teletos. She consorted with herself. And that's what is expressed here. Here you see it's all in German. But this is Sophia. Sophia consorted with herself and created the world as we know it. That's according to this interpretation, that Sophia was the goddess who made all this. That's one of the basic ideas of Gnosticism, or actually a part of Gnosticism. So that's why she is so important. And if you look carefully, you can see the three concentric rings here too. But now it's filled in from Sophia's perspective. And I'm not going to explain all this here. I'm just showing this picture. Yeah, and it says Jungfrau, that means actually virgin. And we'll come back to this. Because Sophia was indeed a virgin in the sense that she did not consort it with her husband, yeah, Teletos, volition. She did it all by herself. So we have the God in the middle, or any other name you like to refer to that source in the middle. Yeah, the oneness and from that emanation of the oneness, we get the pleroma. And there are gods. First eight, then ten, and then twelve. 
And then we have the outer ring, the canoma, and it is said that it's, it's a mirror of this. So there have to be 8, 10, and 12 gods here as well. Now I'll come back to that. But there's something different with the mirroring, because it's not a literal mirroring. Sometimes things are put upside down. Holy Science explains that in full detail as well. I'm just going to uh, address it here, not more than that. The outer ring, that's the world of the mundane, yeah, the worldly world, yeah, the world as we know it. But the, the pleroma is the super mundane. It's higher than that. Yeah, so our senses cannot go into that. Yeah, they cannot go into the spiritual world. They stay in the sensible world. And the sensible world is known as the emptiness or the void because it is filled with, yeah, you can say corrupted or perverted images from the spiritual world. That's what we find in the Kenoma. That's the understanding uh, of the Gnostics. That's how they understood it. And it all goes back to Plato. Plato explained this, all this in his metaphor of the cave. So at the very top, yeah, level seven is this actually. Yeah, you can count down from the top, one, two, three, to seven. But if you count up, this is the seventh heaven. And, and God we find in the seventh heaven. So this is the heaven of God. And this is the heaven before the creation, because from the heaven of God, the creation starts. And on the first day, this was created. And on the second day, this level was created. And so on. Until the sixth day, this level was created. So that's the whole of reality. Three levels in the Pleroma and three levels in the Kenoma. First the Ogdaat, Ogdoat, sorry, then the Dekat, and then the Dodekat. And then it's different here because this is 8, 10, 12. And here we see 10, 12, 8. So it's, it's a little bit different. Yeah, because at the physical plane, we have eight directions of the wind, if you like. North, north, east, east, and so on. This is the physical plane, the world of man, the world as we know it. On top of that, beyond the senses, we find the second level, the second heaven, if you want. Yeah, because this first heaven can also be called the hell. Yeah, this is the hell too, the lowest heaven. And here we have the first layer above that. So sometimes this is called heaven and this is called earth. But it's a little bit confusing because these are all heavens, actually. They're all realms or planes. And at the second, from the bottom, so, yeah, I name it now level six from the top. This astral plane, there are 12 eons. And we know these eons as the 12 signs of the zodiac. So they rule here. And here at this level, the Nasik plane, there are five planetary regions. These are Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And they both have a yin side and a yang side, or a positive and a negative side, or any like you want to call it. But it means a doubling of five, and that's ten. So that's why we have ten here. <coughs> yeah, and then we have the buddhic plane. That's the treasury of light. All the light emanates from here into the lower realms. And then the atmic plane, it says the first space of the first mystery. And that's true because space is created here at this level. Here, there is only movement or you can better say uh, time. Yeah, so there is only movement in time and movement in space starts here. Yeah, this is the logos, the logic, the, the logical order in your everything. Yeah, the, the principles. And then we find the one and only at the top. Yeah, maybe this goes too fast for you, then you better watch the 30 videos of Holy Science. I explain it in more detail. And I'm now showing it here to make you understand that the Gnostics knew. They knew about all, the, all of this. And Sophia is the last goddess, if you want, the lowest goddess of the play Roma, and she did not have concert with her husband, but she created a child of her own. And in order to do that, 
she had to go down to the Kenoma. So she, she descended. She descended to here, and then her name became Sophia Achamo. Uh, they gave her a different name to, to show you the difference between the Sophia of the Pleroma and the Sophia of the Kenoma. Yeah, this is in the physical world. So she entered the physical world, the sensible world, the world that we can perceive. And in that world, she created a son without having consort with a male partner. So she was a virgin, a virgin creating a son. And the son is named Demiurge. And the Demiurge, or Demiurge, the Demiorgos, in Greek, the Demiurge became the ruler at this level, the ruler directly on top of the physical plane. And that's why the people who want to rule this world, this physical plane of us, they worship the Demiurge because he's directly on top of them. And they think by honoring him, by worshiping him, they can do whatever they want in the physical world. That's their way of reasoning and that's what they've been doing for long the psychopaths who want to rule this reality. But there's a mi big difference between the Demiurge at this level, actually the second heaven from the bottom, and the seventh heaven of God. And in the previous episodes, I talked a lot about God, but the main question I also raised there is, which God are we talking about? Is it the God of the top, or is it the God at this level, the Demiurge? Yeah, so that's, that's the picture we get. The one and only true God is in the center, in the heart, in the source. Sophia was the lowest goddess of the Pleroma, and she wanted to make everything continue, so she descended to this level, the Kenoma, that's why she had a different name, and she gave birth to the Demiurge without having uh, intercourse with a male partner. So she was still virgin when she begot the Demiurge. And the Demiurge, or the Demiorgos, he was in the beginning simply named the craftsman or the artisan because he was creating in the physical world. But later on he became more worshipped. First they named him the producer and later on even the creator. But the real and only creator is of course God the creator in the center of reality. But somehow this Demiurge inherited also the title of creator and was worshipped as the creator. But he is not the real creator of heavens and the earth. At least not in my understanding. And he was also named Yaldabot or Yalta. And in the Gnostic writings, he was named Sabbath Adamas. Yeah, of the great tyrants or the lion faced power. These are all names of a very evil God. And that is why we find, I'll come back to that, we find the name El in the old scriptures, in the, in the uh, holy scripture. El is most of the time referring to the Demiurge because that is the one worshipped by Judaism and by Christianity. Yeah, and actually all religions, they honor the Demiurge, not the one true God. No, this lower God, yeah, very low, directly above the physical plane. And these are other names of that Demiurge, Saklas or Samuel or Satan. Yeah, this is of course the most well-known, Satan. But also Ariman, and he is he jot her bahe in the Yiddish writing, and the Khazar writing, jot her bahe, meaning Yahweh, but they, uh, the Judaic people, uh, the Judaic believers don't pronounce that name. They say Adonai when they see this. That means the Lord. But their Lord is the Demiurge, not the one true God in the middle. It's very important to understand this. And this is what we see in the Pisti Sophia. Yeah, it is said that this Sabbath, the Adamas, is evil and wickedness. Yes, the devil. He is accused of inappropriate sexual conduct. And actually all the inappropriate sexual conduct that we ever see on this planet is all a kind of worshipping 
of this Adamas creature. Yeah, sex with little children or very violent sex or all those all those crazy way of yeah, doing yeah actually um, spoiling the whole uh, union the, the sacred union act of sacred union it's all worshiping the devil yeah and because he had inappropriate sexual conduct all kinds of organs and other beings are created that's how we create all those demonic entities in our reality by inappropriate sexual conduct and as a result, it is said that this Adamas guy, the devil, was imprisoned in the bounds of the zodiac. Yeah, the one uh, lowest level, the, not the lowest, but the one on top of that. So heaven number two, counted from the bottom. That's why he is bound and he cannot get higher than it. We can, yeah, with our spiritual development, we can go all the way to the top. That's what holy science is telling you and explaining how to do that. But the devil cannot go beyond that. So that's why the devil wants people to stay in the physical realm. Because there he can control them. The moment they go beyond his level, he has no more power over them. And that's of course what holy science is telling you. How you can come beyond the power of the devil. But most people on this planet, they don't want to know about this or and even a lot of people serve openly the devil. They sold their soul to the devil in order to have physical um, or material wealth. And of course the devil can give you that, but he cannot give you something that is beyond his, his uh, realm. For those whom, human souls who did not receive the mysteries before death, yeah, the mysteries you were taught in the mystery schools, it's actually knowledge or science or understanding, Holy science is telling you the mysteries, but the Gnostics did the very same. But you need to understand these mysteries before you have physical death, because otherwise you'll be recycled. Yeah, you are bound to reincarnate again in the world, and again and again and again, until you get it. Because, yeah, he's on top of that. He's in the astral realm, so he controls the souls. And he controls the souls where they go to. And they don't go higher, I can tell you that. I can assure you that, because he wants to bring them down so that he can stay in control. Yeah, and he's also responsible for giving the cup of forgetfulness. The moment we arrive on this planet, when we are physically born, then we forget all about the past, all about previous lives. So we don't know what we learned in those previous lives. It's all forgotten. It's still there in you, in your subconsciousness, it's all there, but you need to understand how to connect with it. Otherwise, it's all gone. And for most people, yeah, maybe 99%, they will never get it. So they stay in this kind of trap forever and ever because they are not interested in spirituality. They're interested in, in the sports games or, or magazines or a new pair of shoes or whatever. That's what they're really interested in. But not understanding how you got here and more importantly, how you can get out of here. Because this world is not where we are supposed to be. Again, his disciples said, tell us clearly how can they came down from the invisibilities. Yeah, the invisibilities are the pleroma. So how could those, those yeah, gods or demons, if you want, how could they come down? Yeah, from the immortal, the pleroma, to the world that dies. Okay, Noma, how did they do that? And then the perfect savior answers and says, son of man, I explained this before, son of man is the antichrist or the devil, consented with Sophia. Well, who is the son of man? Uh, I'll come back to that later. No, no, do it now. The son, son, of, son of man is, of course, the demiurge. So the demiurge consented with Sophia, which is his mother. So it's a son who has sexual intercourse with his mother. And then many, many stories from the ancient times, they talk about this. A son having sexual consent with his mother. And then his mother becomes his consort. And because they have this, so the Antichrist or the Demiurge has sexual intercourse with his mother, they create a great androgynous light. And that is the light that people see. 
the light that people see when they are dead, and they go to the light, but they don't know who that light created. Well, I tell you now that light has been created by the Demiurge, and it's a light that is meant to fool you. So if you die and you remember this, do not go to the light. Yeah, and he got a male and a female name. Its male name was the begetter of all things. So he gets all things. He, he, um, he, he makes them appear. And the female name is Sophia, the all begetters. Yeah, she who get, gets pregnant of everything and is able to deliver it, so to say. And that Sophia, his mother, was a virgin when she got him, when she begot him, when she uh, delivered him. So this is the virgin, Virgin Sophia, yeah, or Jungfrau Sophia in German. This is the Virgin Mary in the, in the Gnostic writings. It's the same woman, it's Sophia, it's Mary. So that's why she was a virgin. She did not consent with willpower, as she was supposed to do. No, it was her own will. And that's why this Demiurge was born. So they create a great androgynous light. And that light that is very inspiring. So we think it's the Christ that lights. When people see that light, they think it's Jesus, or the Christos, or the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ. But they don't know who this light created. So that's a big question here. If you see an angel-like figure in your dreams or in real life, make sure you know who you're talking to. Because the chances are more than likely that it is not created by the one true God, but it is created by the Demiurge who made who had sex with his mother, Sophia. And this light is both female and male. It has two sides, and that's why I think this Baphomet God is both female, you can see the female verse here, and the male, the male phallic symbol here. Well, it's not really a symbol, it's actually a very precise depiction. So that's, that's what we get from the, uh, the, the, the Templars. Yeah, this is Baphomet, their God. And three fingers up and three fingers down is a triangle up and a triangle down, meaning in total six. Yeah, and that's the symbol of the um, of Saturn. So this is a reference to Saturn. Maybe that's the energy they talk about here. Anyway, you need to understand that this is what they worship, and that is also what is depicted in the harbor of New York City in the state of New York. Yeah, this woman has also a very male face. So if you only look at the face. You cannot tell if it's a male or female. So this is both male and female. Yeah, of course, it's depicted as a, um, as a female, because then you can also say she's a sort of kind of virgin, yeah, the mother, Sophia, or Mary. But it is at the same time the Christos, but it's their Christos, their anointed one, not mine. Yeah, and this is then what we find in Christianity. This is the Virgin Mary with her baby. And the lamb, we see here too. And the lamb gives us a real clue what this is all about. Because the lamb is a metaphor for innocence. One who is without blemish. And that's true for the lamb. And why is the lamb full of innocence? Well, because the lamb does not know right from wrong. Yeah, And that's why we think it's so adorable. There is, there is innocence in here. And we have innocence too, until we eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The moment we eat from this tree, we die. Why do we die? Well, the, the lamb in us dies. The innocence in us dies. Because the moment we have this knowledge, and we can tell the difference between right and wrong, then when we do wrong, we are no longer innocent. And then we get what we deserve. It's simple as that. That's how the universe works. So that is what it's all about. And this was gone, this, this happened in the very early stage of humanity. Yeah, that's the story of Adam and Eve. Because they both ate from the tree. 
So from the very start of humanity, we knew about the difference between good and evil. And if you then choose to do wrong, well, then you have the consequences to bear. Yeah, we saw this already in the second episode of uh, Holy Scripture Television. John 13, verse 8, or actually the revelations of John. Yeah, mostly called only revelations. 13, verse 8. And they worship him, all dwelling on the earth. The him is the, uh, the, the devil. Yeah, the demigods. Everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, having been slain from the founding of the cosmos. Now, on the world, but literally it says cosmos. So, what does it mean? Well, the lamb which has been slain from the founding of the world, the lamb that has been slain is the lamb that died. And the lamb that dies is anyone who has understanding of good and evil. So, you need first to have understanding of good and evil, and then you have to do good. Only then your name is written in the book of life. That's what it says here. Yeah, so step one, learn the difference between good and evil. If you don't know the difference, then you cannot be in that book. But if you know the difference and then you decide consciously to do good and to not do evil, then your name is in the book of life. So what does it mean? It means if you understand the Ten Commandments, then you follow those Ten Commandments. When you do, then your name is in the book of life. The moment you violate one of those ten, your name is no longer in this book. That's what it says. Simple. So now we come back to the Gnosticists, yeah, the people who had knowledge, Gnosticos in, the, in Greek, having inner knowledge, having spiritual knowledge, having self-knowledge. And it was yeah, somehow uh, based on Platonism. So we can also call Gnosticism Neo-Platonism. And it's not only based on the work of Plato, of, of uh, what he started, but also on ancient insights from Egypt, Hermeticism. And we know that the thrice greatest Hermes was master in alchemy, astrology, and theurgy. That means the work of God. Now, I'm not going to explain this in full detail here, of course. Also, that is in the Holy Science video course. But these are ancient insights from Kemets, ancient Egypt. And it's also based on Mithraism. Yeah, the, the knowledge that Mithras was the personification of the sun. The sun I now name Helios. Yeah, and it was actually named Yazdanism in those days. And then we go back at least 1500 years before our current era. A very long time ago. And from that arose Mahdayanasa. Or Zoroastrianism. Yeah, that was around the year 500 before our current era. And these all came into Gnosticos. Yeah, so the Gnostics knew all about these previous approaches yeah, or religions. And then the Gnostics, Gnosticists, they split into two groups, the Telestai and the Pispics. The Telestai were the ones who were focused on, on knowing. They stayed in the knowing and they want to be initiated in the knowledge. They want to understand. And the other group, they start more to believe things. They didn't need to know everything. They just, they just believed that it was all the way they think it is. And if you understand the story of the house built on rock and the house, first the house built on sand, good. Then you know that these people build their understanding on rock. But this became more and more sand. Yeah. So this house was not strong. And from the pistics, eventually the movement known as Christianity arose. In the beginning, yeah, we can call them the Pistic Christians. But the name Christian became much later because it's all related to the Christos, uh, the anointed one. And they started to believe in the Christ, in the, in the figure of the Christ, the character of the Christ. These people did not believe anything. They want to know. And of course, I'm in here. I'm still at Celestine. I initiated it myself in all of this. And I'm now passing it on to you. So I strongly advise you to also be in this group and do not believe a single word. Not of me, of, but neither of anyone else. The moment you start to believe, you're off your track. 
yeah, and you can go down the hill. And from the Pistics, we first saw the movement that was started by this man, Valentinius, and that's why it's called Valentinianism. And he died in the year 160, and more or less than his movements also died slowly after him. And the other group that arose from this, that is what we now name Christianity. And to be more precise, it's Roman Catholicism. That's actually what I mean by Christianity. But also all the other forms of Christianity, they more or less are the same. So they all trick you because this is the beast, the beast that came out of the dragon. And the dragon is the demiurge or the devil. And out of hermetism, of hermeticism is also uh, other movements, but these are all very dark. Yeah, people think it's about light. They even name it light, but this is not the one true light. This is the light created by the demiurge. And that's why you can also call these all satanic orders. Yeah, for instance, Alistair Crowley uh, was part of this. I think he even founded it. So these are all Satan worshippers. But if you don't know it, they can fool you because they use words that, that you think you know from Christianity, but also Christianity is worshipping the demiurge, the devil. Christianity is also Satanism. No doubt about this. Then we go back to chapter 17 of the Revelations of John. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet appeared. And when he appears, he must continue a little while. Yeah, we already discussed this in episode two of Holy Scriptures Television. Then I mentioned the uh, seven, but now I can be more precise because now you see the names of the first five are a little bit different than when I said them. Then I just named it uh, Babylonian religion and Egyptian religion. But now we can fill in the names. Mitraism, Hermeticism, Zoroastrianism, Platonism, and Valentianism. These are the five religions or kings that were gone in those days. Yeah, nobody worshipped them anymore because this book was written maybe in the year 250. Yeah, officially people make it much earlier, but that's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. It was written clearly after um, the, the Gospels and um, the Gospels were not written before the year 200. So and let's, let's say this was 250. And in those days, these five are all gone. They were all dead. They all have fallen. This one was the one standing and is still standing nowadays. And the one to come, not yet appeared, that was Islam because this one arose in the year 600, sort of 600. So that's true. And then the eighth one and the beast which was and is not. Yeah, in those days, there was no Christianity because Christianity is the worshiping of the devil. And that was not there at least not directly, yeah, via Judaism, but that, that via the, the light of the Christ, it was not there. And the beast which was and is not is also the eighth, the eighth king. And out of the seven years, yes, because it came directly from Palantianismo, but also from the other ones, yeah, especially Mitraism. That's where the eighth beast or king came from. Yeah, and to destruction he is going. Christianity is bringing the world down. Christianity is the reason why we have this major war, which will start soon. Because the end times is all about the collision between Christianity and um, Islam. And Judaism also plays a role in it. That's how humanity is yeah, fed to this demonic entity. This is around the year 700 of our current era. And here you see all the churches from the Pistic Gnostics. Yeah, the believers. The believers created an external gathering, external assembly or church buildings. That's why you see it. The first one was in Antioch. Yeah, some say it was here, but this map says here doesn't really matter. But these were all the buildings where people got together and were believing in the stories 
yeah, believing that it was literally true. And then we had this emperor, Nero, and people say he was feeding Christians to the lions. Well, I think that's a myth. There is no historical evidence at all that this happened. So I think this story is nonsense. But he was uh, persecuting the Nost the 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 pistices, the pistics, sorry, um, because they were a threat somehow to them. Yeah, from this time we got the idea that you have to entertain the people, yeah, give them bread and circuses. And that's what happens nowadays too. Now we have the television, but that's all that the television does. It gives us yeah, entertainment, games, whatever, reality shows, so called reality. Some say this great fire of Rome, which happened in the night between July the 18th and the 19th of the year 64 of our current era, was actually lit by Nero himself, because he wanted to yeah, change the buildings in the center of Rome. But somehow he was able to blame the Pistics for it. And since then the Pistics were persecuted. And it was not too difficult for him to do that, because most people thought the Pistics were antisocial and subversive. Yeah, they didn't want to recognize the power of, of the uh, Emperor Vincent or the Roman Empire. Yeah, they had a different understanding of the hierarchy of the reality. So that's why people thought they were strange. And nobody really had a problem if they were uh, persecuted. So that's why he did it. But of course it was good for them because these people knew something that um, yeah, was not taught by, um, by the government, so to say. So they were also a threat to the powers that should not be. And that same was true for this man. In English, he is named Justin Martyr because he became a martyr. He refused to bow for the devil, for the demiurge, for Satan, for the dark lord. He refused that and he was in a, yeah, in a debate uh, by a writing with the Pharisee because he said your interpretation, the interpretation of the Pharisee of the old scriptures and what we now call the Old Testament is very wrong. You see it wrongly. There is a difference between the Demiurge and the one true God. Because the one true God has sole government over the whole of reality. Yeah, these are six of his books, or actually apologies that he wrote, in order to convince the Pharisees that they were wrong. But he became more and more a threat to the, yeah, the, the people that want to rule the world. And in the end, he was actually murdered. He was hanged. And that's why we call him now a martyr, because he, he paid with his life for his understanding, or actually his belief, together with, I think, six of his closest uh, followers. But what is so important here? Well, this all happened around the year 150 of our current era. So the name I already mentioned before. And this is the time when the Gnostics were trying to convince the people about the truth. And he was one of them, but he was not on the Telestai side, he was on the believer side, on the Pistic side. And he did not mention once one of the Gospels. And that's strange because according to the official story, these Gospels were already written in those days. And this is where he was living. Yeah, what we now call the West Bank, near the city of Nablus. Yeah, it was, that's where he was living. So he would have known about the Gospels, because they were written in the same area, if, if that's what we believe, at least. Yeah, that's what is said. And they were written in Greek, and he was written, writing in Greek as well. So he must have known about these writings if they were already there. So this is a clear proof that the Gospels were not written before the year 150 of our current era. Yeah, and my conclusion is they were written around the year 200. And not based on historical events, and if you still believe that, then you better stop watching. It's all based about, based on insight. In, insight of people who are initiates or who are believing. And then much later, yeah, in the year 300, in the 4th century, we got this emperor, Constantine. And later he was named Constantine the first because he was the first one with the name Constantine. And he declared himself great in the last days of his life and after he was dead 
the Roman Catholicism uh, Church or whatever you like to call them, the, the criminal organization of the Roman Catholics, they even made him a saint. So they said somehow he had divine qualities. Well, this was a simple man. But what did he do to deserve this kind of quality is that he was able to somehow trick the Pistics to become part of Christianity. Yeah, first he declared official toleration of the Pistics. Yeah, Pistics or Christianity, you can, you can use both names here. And then he started to build a huge temple or, or whatever you like to call it for, the, for that society, for that movement. Yeah, we now know it as the St. Peter's Basilica. The original version was built, but it was start to build in the year 322. And 322 is a very meaningful number to me. And then 325, yeah, three years later, the first council of Nicaea. He called it together. He called all the people to come to Turkey, in this town, Nicaea. And there he united all the people who were actually Pistics. So the Pistics were united under the label of Christianity. And that's why they call him Saint afterwards, because he was able to pull this off. And why did he do that? Well, very simple. If you cannot beat them, join them. They were unable to somehow wipe away all the Pistics. And that's why they decided to infiltrate the movement, rename it, and take it over. And that happened. Rome took it over. And actually, Catholicism as we now know it, or Christianity in general, is the Roman perversion of Pistic Gnosticism. That's the truth. And that's why all those ancient Gnostic stories are so much similar to the stories we find nowadays in the Holy Scripture. Because it's all about the same origin, Gnosticism. But the perverted version, that's the one we find nowadays. Um, delivered to us from Rome. And this bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, he was the one who said these 66 books, they are now the official version. And this, this is what we now call the Bible, yeah, the church law, the canon, the standard doctrine. And all the other books about the very same themes, they are what we now call apocryphal. They are, not, um, they are not according to the church. Uh, they are not, yeah, I'm not sure how to say this. But the church does not recognize them as holy books, so to say. But they are the very same. Yeah. So it's very remarkable that they were able to do this. And anyone who is somehow trying to tell the truth, you can see that all these people are enlightened. All these enlightened people in ancient days were tortured and killed, murdered in many ways because they were a huge threat to the, yeah, the, the, the powers that should not be from Rome. They tried to fool people with a literal story. Well, it's actually a, 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 a metaphor for spiritual enlightenment. But nobody gets enlightened through Christianity. Nobody. They all think that they're all brainwashed. Christianity is a brainwashing program. If you want to know the truth, then you have to study Gnosticism, or I made it more easy for you, you study holy science. Fortunately for us, there were books found in the year 1945 that happened near this town called Nak Hammadi in Egypt, yeah? a little bit north of Luxor. Here, in this um, they found these 13 books. And those books contained in total 52 stories or Gnostic treatises. Treatises, sorry. And one of those, or three of those uh, 52 are from the Corpus Hermeticum. Yeah, as we said earlier, the Hermetic science or Hermeticism. So it's clear that the oranges are, are from that. But also a part of the Republic from Plato is there. It's not only translated because these were all written in Coptic. The original one was written in Greek. But it's also altered a little bit. So how can you alter a story? You can only do it if you have understanding. 
So the Gnostics knew, and they improved on the story, just like I did. Yeah, Holy Science is also an improvement on the work of Plato, because I know what he was trying to explain. But I can explain it now better, because we have more uh, uh, analogies to, to use, and our understanding of reality has also evolved. So I can, I can explain much more precise what he tried to explain to the people in those days with his vocabulary. These are these 52 stories. Yeah, some of them are very powerful. Yeah, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas. Many people have heard of this. But this is a very powerful gospel. Yeah, and other stories are very important too. So if you read this, then you become more or less in the knowing, but only if you understand the stories. Yeah, you can believe all this, and then you are pistic, then you are a believer, or you can use these stories to come into the know, to understand, and then you are welcome to holy science. So this is the timeline, more or less, and yeah, the prosecutions of the pistics, but also the other Gnostics, started in the year 64. Yeah, after the great fire in Rome, and that w continues. Yeah, and then here in this year, 165, the um, Justin Martyr, Justice Martyr, he was hanged. So people were killed of this. And then people created new stories. Yeah, that is here, the Gospels. So the insights were written in the with the character Jesus, and no longer Mithras, but Jesus became in the place of Mithras. That happened around the year 200 and so on. And then they saw, the, the people, that the powers that should not be from Rome, that they were not able to conquer this. So they joined them. And that's why we have the Council of Nicaea, the first one. This was the start of Catholicism, or Christianity, or how you like to call it. Yeah, because all the pistics were brought into this movement. And then later on, the Pistic movement stopped. Yeah, and then in the start of Catholicism, the Bible was established, the canonical Bible, the canon, the canon law, yeah, the law according to Rome, or the Catholicism. And in those days, it was very dangerous to have Gnostic writings, yeah, because they were seen as heresy. So that's why the people who translated these stories into a Coptic, they hide it very carefully because it was very dangerous to, uh, to get caught with these scriptures. But thanks to what they did then, yeah, maybe around the year 400 they were written, I'm not sure when they put in the ground, but those stories show us a different history. And if it were not for these stories, we would not have known this. Because the powers are so powerful that they wiped out everything. They thought they wiped out everything, but they did not wipe out this, these stories hidden in the ground. Fortunately for us. And now we can see how they tricked the world. Now we can see that Christianity is the beast. The beast that murdered so many people. Yeah, because they were exposing the, the perversion, perversion of Christianity. Yeah, for instance, Jesus is based on this character, Mithras. Yeah, that's the Greek name, Mithras. Um, the Vedics, yeah, in ancient India, they talk about Mitra. That's their god. But it's the same. And you can see on the arrays on his head that this is the light, the light of the sun. This is the personification of the sun. And I now I now know name this sun Helios. Yeah, here again. See the sun. This is the sun, and this is the moon. It's very clear. Helios and Luna. And when this came to Rome, then they made this story. He said he was born on December 25. Why? Because that's the first day when the nights become shorter and the days become longer. This is the rebirth of the light bringer, the risen one, Helios, the sun, Jesus, or Mithras. It's all the same. Yeah, born of a virgin. Twelve disciples performed miracles. Yeah, the sun is dead for three days. That's true. Because after the winter solstice, there are three days with very long nights and short days. But after those three, 
the days become a little bit longer. And that's the rebirthing of the light. Yeah, that happens on December 25th. Yeah, the sun god, worshipped on the Sunday. It all is the same. But we know these stories now only from Jesus. But in those days they were told with the main character as Mitras. Yeah, or Mitra. Mitras is the Greek name. So this is Mitras, or Jesus, the Son, the Enlightened One. Yeah, in John 8, verse 12. And therefore to, to them spoke Jesus, saying, I am the light of the cosmos. Yeah, he says cosmos. I don't translate it. So it's the cosmos, the world, yeah, the physical world. The one following me shall not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Yeah, this is the life, uh, the life bringing light. Yeah? Living light, enlightenment. So you become enlightened if you follow the yeah the sun, the example of the sun, Helios. So it's about this light bringer, yeah, the risen one. Every day he rises up again, day after day, and he brings light to this world. This is Helios, yeah, in Greek mythology. This is Jesus in so-called Christian mythology. This is Mithras in Sumerian mythology or, or Mesopotamian mythology. Yeah, and many others too. Ahau in, in Maya mythology. It's all the same. This is the light bringer. The one that can also make us enlightened if we understand the essence of light. But what happened at the Council of Nicaea, the first one? Docetism, that's the, that's the official name for saying that Jesus was never a physical man. Yeah, the whole historical Jesus is nonsense. Yeah, that's docetism. That was unequivocally rejected. So from that day on, it was heresy if you said that Jesus was not a human being. Yeah, they would kill you. If they caught you and you were saying, Jesus is simply the personification of the Son, what I'm doing right now. If I said that, uh, about 2,000 years ago, they would have surely killed me. But fortunately for now, for, for me, um, or maybe I was there, I don't know. But now I can say this, and hopefully you get it, because this is the truth. And anyone who says there was a historical Jesus is lying to you, because there is no proof at all. And actually it doesn't really matter at all if there was one in those days who was enlightened or not. Yeah, I can guarantee you that there was someone enlightened in those days because there are always enlightened people always there are always mystery schools enabling people to get there but nowadays we can get there in in the multitude many people and that's of course the purpose of holy science to break free from the darkness yeah if you look at the coptic version they gave jesus jesus a new name it said Jesus, who is called Abaramento, and Abaramento is a Coptic name, but it also has a meaning, and the meaning is glory of the sun. Need I say more? Radiance of the light. That's what it's all about. It's the light, the radiance of the light, the enlightened one. Yeah, that's what we see here. Here, here you see it in Coptic writing, Abaramento. So these people knew. That Jesus was the Son. This is what we see in the very start of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Logos. Yeah, I don't translate. Here you see Logos. And the Logos was with Theos. Here you see Theos. And the Logos was Theos. Yeah, you can translate these words. You can say Theos is God and Logos is the word. But that doesn't, that doesn't cover it all. Logos is much more than a word. Logos is the, is the logic of the, uh, of the whole of creation. Yeah, it's the start of the whole of creation. It's the beginning. Yeah, and this one, so the Logos was in the beginning with Theos. That, that's the start of everything. And all things through him, the him is the Logos, not the Theos, but the, the Logos, emerge. And without him emerged not even one thing that has emerged. So everything. Everything immersed through the Logos. 
in him, in the Logos, was life. So Logos is life. And the life was the light of man. So for man, it is the light. Yeah, the, and light is it's about consciousness. So if your consciousness is full of light, then you are living, then you are alive. If your consciousness is not full of light, you are dead. Yeah, not physically dead because you can still walk and you can still buy everything and do whatever you want. But you are not in the book of the living, in the book of life, because you are spiritually dead. That's what it's all about. Light in your consciousness. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. No, the moment you become enlightened, the darkness has no more power over you. Darkness is not powerful. But you have to be light. Then the darkness cannot touch you. But if you are still part of the darkness, yeah, then the darkness can surely touch you and can fool you with its own fake light. And that's what happens a lot. Now, all the religions are actually based on that fake light of the demiurge of the devil. So this is the story. The one true God is in the center, Theos. And the first thing the Theos created was the Logos. And from the Logos, everything else emerged. And that Logos created life, life energy. And the life energy is light to us. So we perceive it as light. Our senses tell us it is light, but it is actually life energy. And in that outer realm, there is also darkness. So if we do not connect with the life force, then we are in darkness too. So this is the world of duality, the outer ring, light and darkness. And you have to pick a side. Because if you don't, you are automatically part of the darkness. Because it, you need conscious uh, effort to stay in the light. Yeah, without your conscious effort, you will immediately go to the darkness again. Yeah, you have to keep your own light burning, otherwise it will go out. The outer ring is the world of the phenomena. Yeah, in German, Immanuel Kant said, Ding für mich, so the way things appear to me, how you perceive it, yeah, the impression you get. And that's the sensible world, the world you see with your senses, you perceive with your senses. The material realm, the physical plane. Yeah, that's all a reference to the outer ring, the pleroma. The kingoma, sorry. And the pleroma, the, this ring, the middle, that's the super sensible because it's above the sensible. It's immaterial, immaterial. Yeah, it's not made, made of matter. And it's above the meta, above the physical, so it's metaphysical. And we cannot see this middle ring, because there is the veil, the veil that hinders our senses to go beyond. So we have no idea there is more than the physical reality when we only trust our senses. But with knowledge, with understanding, with holy science, we can understand there is more than the physical realm. And then we enter the second ring. Yeah, this is what the priest did. The priests were allowed here. Common people were staying, were not allowed further than this. Priests went beyond the veil, so to say. And the high priest, they went into the holy of the holy in the middle. And Immanuel Kant named the second ring the noumena. Or actually he said ding an sich in German. So the thing in itself. This is how the things are in itself. This, these are the perfect um, original, so to say, and the perverted or the corrupted copies we find outside. That's the understanding of Plato. Yeah, I nowadays explain a little bit different, but the essence is there. So, if you've liked this, yeah, it was about, um, of course, Pistis very much, but it was also a lot about holy science because, yeah, I. I made this video series for you to understand how to break free from the illusionary world, how to break free from the control by the L, the demiurge, because that's very important. Otherwise, you'll be trapped in this, yeah, this most lower realm, and I don't think that's a good idea. So I hope you appreciate it, and remember what I said in the beginning, if this is not worthless to you, then you know what to do. For now, I thank you very much. Namaste.